Welcome to the Voice of Mountain Sledding, the Mountain Sledder Podcast with Mike Reed. Nick, thanks for joining us tonight in the Mountain Sledder Studio. Mike, thanks for having me. It's uh, that time of year where you're rigging up new trucks, new sleds. Everyone's getting geared up for the new season. And I think every time I run into you, you have a new pickup truck. What are you rolling right now? Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I'm rolling in a 2024 Duramax right now. Um, just finished building it. Uh, no limit. Troy there, he, he deals with my madness with trucks for years now. Um, I, uh, I love trucks, love building them. I'm always going through trucks. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's just a little bit of it's a side ob- passion thing that it's I got going on. It's an obsession almost. It is it's an obsession. beyond a passion, I think, at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for a while there, you took a step back in time. Would you get an 07 LBZ or whatever? Yeah, I picked up a 2006 LB7 nice. Max from a original owner. And uh, it was in mint condition. He just used it to tow his camper in the States back and forth. And so it was immaculate. He didn't use it a whole lot. But, yeah, the, uh, the thing was mint condition. I remember that, but it yeah. was short lived because what you had a necessity for the more power, didn't you, or what? Yeah, I started throwing power to it right away. <laughs> of course, you did, and I didn't like that. So then started wrecking parts, and then that's just a never ending trail. And it's funny, like you look at an old truck you're like that, you're like, oh, that was some of the best years of the Duramax, and everyone talks about it, and everything. But it's like it does not compare in any way to what the technology is today. To be like well over in the four figures for torque tons of horsepower and not bad fuel economy really considering what these trucks are capable of today oh yeah for sure i mean like what you get in a truck now is close to 500 horse stock out of the box and years ago we're spending tens of thousands of dollars on these old trucks trying to get them to that horsepower and then they get them to live there you know remember like the CV axles had to be upgraded and drive shafts you're always worried about yeah. and what's going to happen to your rear end. Like it just, it was just a long line of things that were about to fail because you're upping the horsepower to that range. Yeah. It was a matter of when is the next part going to break. You're no stranger to diesel and horsepower. You actually ended up racing trucks like back in high school, like with your younger years. And then what were you telling me? You even took them down to the States. Like you did some serious racing and diesel pickups. Yeah, I um I started just out of high school building a truck and uh got into racing with some people and did a bunch of local racing here and kind of started cleaning house and then I kind of got an addiction <laughs> with that and that's where the whole diesel thing started and then yeah, we toured down to the states and Montana and went down got invited to go to the world finals in Texas. Wow. So uh yeah, that was an eye opener. That was that was wild. So how did your truck compare to some of the guys down in the States? I mean, in my class, I was, I'd say, on the upper end of the horsepower range. Really? Um, I was around the six, 700 horsepower range. But, I mean, there's guys down there with 2,000 plus horsepower diesel trucks. Whoa. So, yeah. Yeah, that's unreal. So take us through, if no one's been around the quarter mile drag strip with diesels going down. You guys are basically putting as much fuel through with as big turbos you can put on this thing and you're running it in all-wheel drive, like four-wheel drive down the strip. Yeah. And that's just because it would never stick, no matter how good your slicks were because you didn't have the engine and the weight. Like a rear engine dragster has the weight over the rear tires, but you guys got the engine up front, so you're just fighting it the whole way down the drag. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can feel the truck like fighting side to side as you take off when you launch, but I know I was always upgrading my brakes because, yeah, I was pouring so much fuel and so much boost that trying to hold the truck back at the line to not like jump the light you would uh i'd start pushing through the lights and i'm fighting the turbo and yeah. crazy yeah it's wild yeah so what uh what was that feeling to go through the traps at like what was it like 120 miles an hour or 130 what were you t- what were you pushing in uh i was like 100 to 110 at the most okay mile an hour but that's um, a lot for like a six to 8,000 pound truck, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, my tires weren't balanced at all ever. So, I mean, the thing's, the thing's just shaking by the time I get to the end of the track. My EGTs are through the roof because oh, I don't wow. have my truck built proper. And yeah. So, did you have big engine failures, big meltdowns? Uh, blew some head gaskets, um, blew some transmissions, driveline mostly. And in those days, who was doing your engine work? 
Uh, so I got DFC in, in uh, Calgary to in Edmonton to do a bunch of work on my truck and then uh, got some parts at that time, Supreme Diesel. Okay. Um, yeah. So they did, I worked a lot with them. And so. were you doing a lot of the wrenching yourself, like pulling heads off, changing, you know, head gaskets, stuff like that? Or uh, When I could. I was always busy working a lot, so whenever I was working, my truck was always in the shop getting something done to it. But uh, And what size of turbos were you running? Uh, I think I was running like a BD Stage 5 on that old white truck I had, so it was like a 78 millimeter turbo. Stock was like 62. Oh, wow. So it was too much turbo. And that was a Chevy you were running? Yeah. Yeah, nice. it was an old LB7, so. Oh, crazy. Yeah. That's why you bought the LB7. You wanted to go back to your old roots? Oh, yeah. I love that old <laughs> LB7. They're a really good, strong motor, so. So speaking of the, you know, current setup you've got right now, you're working with Gunmetal Fab to get yourself a flat deck on the back of it and getting it kitted right out for sled season. Yeah. So uh, I said I'd never lift another truck again, but I lifted another truck again. <laughs> so uh, no limit kind of talked me into that troy's really good at that but i trust his word he's uh he's the best when it comes to all that stuff he knows what he's talking about oh yeah and um and then yet yeah, worked working with gunmetal fab kind of my idea was like i could still run a lifted truck and then with the flatbed essentially i'm gonna be lower than what a sled deck would be on a box so. yeah that'll be nice to load it and get on and off yeah the one thing that i do like about the decks though is the storage underneath and you, so you're gonna have some belly boxes and totes and stuff like that yeah that was also my kind of idea with it there's um, a lot of flatbeds out there that are like fancy looking and all you know body lined with the truck this one's gonna have a bunch of storage cabinets and like big cabinets i can put like my whole gear bag in the cabinet yeah that'll be nice lots of storage yeah so you and I are no stranger to, you know, getting into sled zones where you need decks. You know, it's not like four place sled trailers, like riding out in Kako, for instance. Um, it's a long ways on gravel. <laughs> yeah. You're 200K on gravel or, you know, 120 miles type thing. Uh, one way on gravel getting in there and, you know, chains are never a bad idea because it's a gnarly road. Um, this thing's going to be badass for that, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, Josh is probably a little nervous. There was like a few years, the last lifted truck I had, springtime, we're going up the logging road and I got all squirrely on a corner and my truck's like three tires are in the air and I'm almost falling off the bank. Josh is looking down at the ditch and he's like, oh man, Nick. And I was like, we're going to get her. She's a Chevy. And she pulled out of there, but. No way. Oh yeah. You was, guys almost put it on its side. Oh yeah. yeah. Where was that going? Where are you guys going up to? I think we were heading up Boulder in Revelstoke and like, uh like the most common area and yeah. here you guys are almost falling off the side of the road yeah no it was uh but that's not the boulder everyone can relate to when you park in the l two lower parking lots this is boulder where you guys were punching up oh yeah we were punching through snow banks and yeah it was fun but scary on a lifted truck so no doubt well i bet you're stoked to uh get that thing out and you're gonna do some power adders to it too or no i said i wasn't going to but then you said you weren't gonna lift it either yeah i said that too and then I recently talked to Troy and as soon as a delete comes available, then she's going to doing it. it. Yeah. So a good boy. You're a yeah. good old Albertan boy working for the oil and gas company. So you just got to keep, keep pushing it. Yeah, that's right. You got to look the part when you roll up to the parking lot, they know where you're from. Yeah. The red plates. They'll know who I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you like setting up trucks. You like racing trucks. You also like setting up sleds, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, that's probably one of my favorite things that I look forward to at the beginning of every season is building my sled. And you've got it to a point where you were mentioning like when you take out a stock sled at the beginning of the season and then all of a sudden you hop onto yours, it's like night and day. Like you know where the base point, starting point is where you need to do say X, Y, and Z to get it to there. And you're yeah. like, yeah, okay. Now it's just fine tuning. What are those things, those base things that you do to your sled to get it like just started for the season? Um, I mean, immediately suspension is like the first thing I notice right away. I mean... The factory suspension is pretty good for you know average yeah average riding but i i notice it right away yeah um like bar setup clutching i mean the sleds come really good out of the box for sure but i mean just recently riding my sled stock for my first ride this year i was like wow like <laughs> what a difference yeah it, it really goes to show you and, and then i mean i just i just enjoy that because then i i know the products that I'm running work 
and when people refer you know to or ask questions you know i got i got the answers so yeah yeah you work uh pretty tightly with some of the aftermarket guys like your buddy jody there does clutch kits and things like that so are you guys out on the mountain quite often testing yeah we've spent a lot of days just testing tuning it not working coming back down the mountain swapping everything things breaking you know and just uh just working with the companies to try and fine-tune everything so that uh so it's the best it can be for the customers so yeah a lot of time on the mountain doing that R&D work. You mentioned yeah. you took out your sled the other day and already noticed a rail was tweaked. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, I went down to Revelstoke, got my new sled, started building it, realized I forgot my Ice Age stuff at home. So I uh, had some boys that were in Revy and they're like, hey, you should come out. And I was like, oh, there's not much snow, but I'll give her a whirl. It was log hopping and tree bashing and rocks and like guys Such low snow. carnage everywhere. So yeah, I she was uh, tweaked when I was looking at it on the truck. So so you almost have to run the bomber rails. Yeah, at at minimum classics. I started running the classics just because uh, it's less weight and so far they've been holding up. So they look the same, but they're way beefier, aren't they? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah they look like a stock rail. Yeah, way way better grade aluminum and um, just way stronger. I was I thrashed them pretty hard last season and didn't tweak anything. So nice, yeah. Watching you on a sled, you've got a pretty unique style, and like you love to do like wheelie bow tie re entries, like to the point where like I don't think I've seen anyone in Canada do them better than you. <laughs> and I think it's a, has a lot to do with like how lanky you are on the sled, where like you can get that leverage to where you want it. In this case, it's like kind of back over the rear tunnel. Yeah. And like just pulling that thing around. I remember one year, years ago, I had a turbo RMK and it was just like, that thing just did not want a wheelie. And like, you know, like no one could get the skis off the ground, but here you are like, oh, let me try it. <laughs> sure enough, like big bow tie on it. And it's like, <laughs> it's so cool to see in, you know, you've perfected that. It doesn't matter where you at, where you're at on the mountain or, you know, what the snow conditions are like, you are able to do one like anywhere, flip of a dime. Yeah, I, uh, Honestly, the first time I ever saw them done was personally that I remember it was uh, Brandt was doing them. And uh, I just, I remember I was in Eagles one day and I just accidentally kind of did it. I didn't even mean to. And then I was like, oh, that kind of felt cool. And so then I just started practicing it. And uh, my height definitely helps for sure. Um, your long arms, your long limbs. Yeah, I mean, it, that sled can flip right out of the snow and i can just stand on the snow and hold on to the handlebars and yeah it's wild to watch around. yeah it's very cool but i mean like guys like caleb you know they just muscle that sled around oh, yeah. it's um it's pretty cool to watch when it happens you mentioned watching barant when you were growing up that's probably who you idolized most growing up yeah i uh the f i think the first ever sledding film i ever got was christmas gift and it was i think sled next eight Oh man, what a good series that yeah. was. So um, kind of once I was allowed to start watching those movies because my parents were never like, oh, that's they, dangerous stuff. They knew but, it. Yeah. Well, and they knew it would get you hooked. Oh, for sure. And uh, yeah, no, Brant was just someone that I kind of really picked out. and and. Uh, but who didn't, man? Like yeah. that, he's such it, a, you know, an idol in the sport. So mm -hmm. many people looked up to him. You know, another name that keeps coming up from that series eight nine that area was uh quinlan yeah um yeah. another one that was just pushing the limits hard with their sled and what they were capable of doing and it's super cool to see that you know it doesn't matter your age or where you came your background <laughs> it's like there's these guys that really stood out and i think borch in canada is one of those two jeff kyle rob alford like all those guys yeah 100%. um so fast forward a few years and you get into sledding you start getting you know <laughs> Your personality is obvious. You're getting addicted to this sledding oh, yeah. thing. And you travel down to Colorado to go ride with Chris? Yeah. Um, that was a surprise uh, gift, actually, from my girlfriend at the time, now wife. And uh, I, I was just blown away. I, I just never thought that I'd get to go ride with Chris. And What a gift. Yeah. <laughs> All the wives out there listening. Like, yeah. Yeah. Tears, uh, tears getting a gold star for that one. Yeah, 100%. It was... Uh, honestly kind of life-changing for my sledding um what year was that that you went down there i believe that was 20 2015 and uh 
I rode Skidoo at the time. And so I was very much driven with Skidoo and, you know, typical sledders, any other brand is no good type of thing. That's right. right. And uh, I got down there and I think at that time, um, Ross was actually just a mechanic. Oh, okay. In the shop. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was just kind of starting to come out and tailgate and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I got out with Chris. He let me ride his turbo monster that time. Um, tore the arms and everything off of it the one day. No way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So and, you went uh, down there, rented sleds, obviously, you flew into Denver or whatever, and then did the trip yeah, out? Yeah, Denver. They picked me up from Denver. And uh, I think it was like a two hour drive to Chris's shop and they had the lodge and whatnot there and kind of gave us a tour of everything. And then uh, it was only about a 20 minute drive up the mountain. But the crazy thing too, we were unloading at like 9,000 feet. Did you have any problems with the altitude there? Oh, big time. Yeah. Chris, Chris mentioned, he's like, make sure you guys bring lots of water. You know, you're going to need it. And I was a young kid. I was just like, yeah, whatever, Chris. Like, let's go. Let's go ride. I can ride all day. This is fine. You know, hour into the riding, like I got up the trail and I was gassed already. Just so, um, that was a learning curve for sure. But, uh. Yeah. It, some of the areas, they, like Tin Cup or whatever, the pass and stuff is like 11,000 feet. Yeah. Like you're up there. Yeah. You're ways up there. And you kind of forget you're just, like you mentioned you're just like no yeah i know it. i got riding and it's back home but you forget like um, the majority of the riding we do around revelstoke and that is like 6500 feet or yeah. less like it's yeah, not exactly. that high no it's not and you can you know you can get into zones where you're scoping out the peaks and getting up there but it's you don't spend a lot of time there like a lot of the good riding we go to is like way lower yeah yeah. So you're out riding with Chris. Ross is there. Yeah. You're obviously a kid with your jaw dropped the entire time around there. Oh yeah. I mean, Chris is doing all these crazy things that I'm watching on films, and I'm just like starstruck, and uh, to the point where I was just sitting there watching him, and he's like, Nick, like, let's go ride, like, let's go for a rip, and I was like, he's like, follow me, and I was like, oh my god, no way. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, I uh, followed him, got stuck a lot, hit a lot of logs and whatnot, and. But uh, no, it was fun. And honestly, I remember the first night I uh, messaged Tierra and I said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but this Polaris is unreal. It's working. And it's working. I don't know if it was the snow there or whatnot, but, you know, from that point on, it's funny now that I'm, that I'm riding a Polaris, but I love them. But yeah, no, it was, it was uh, an unreal experience. I think it doesn't matter what that guy rides. He can make it look good, I think, right? Oh, yeah. He makes it look really easy. Back it's, on the cat days, early sled necks, he made that thing just fly so yeah, nice. Everyone yeah. loved that. And then he was doing like some big board jaws, you know, 1,000s and stuff. Yeah, and like made 1, him look 1,000 twin pipe Yeah, cats, he yeah. made them look like they were just unstoppable. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it, you know, you get a good quality rider on any brand and it's just like, you'll want that sled because yeah. they make it do things yeah. where you're like, if I get on that. So did you come in to that experience like with set expectations and were you humbled or were you kind of like, mm, I just want to go there and ride with this guy? No, I think obviously I wanted to ride with him. I wanted to meet him and all that, but uh, I, I really much wanted to learn and uh, just soak up as much as you and could. And just soak up what I could. And I mean, the first day I didn't do a whole lot of riding because I was just watching and just taking it all in but uh i rode two more days and uh just in those two days i noticed myself progress right away nice and just more confident and i was like yeah i could do this like i really want to do this and keep pushing so so you're saying it's worth it people, oh yeah. people go down there oh 100 percent. well and he, he did some trips up to canada I, I don't think he's doing it much anymore but what an opportunity for canadians to go you know you don't have to fly all the way down to colorado to go check it out and ride with them and I got a chance to cross paths with him, I think, two or three times at Grizzly. And it was Grizzly, like, yeah. yeah, cool area. And I think they love coming up because like the snow quality we have in BC is just like nothing they've got down there. Even though they're at 11,000 feet, it's dry, right? Like yeah. it's the high Sierras and they're just, they don't get the precip like we do. Yeah. So yeah, I think they, he welcomes the opportunity to come ride up here for sure. Oh, for sure. It's really sugary kind of snow. I noticed. Really dry. There. Dry stuff. Yeah. 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 But they get it. I mean, he was riding, I think, in October already or something. So yeah, I was jealous. I yeah. commented. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so do you guys still keep in touch? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, 
I try to keep touch as much as I can, whether it's during the hunting season or if it's talking sled parts or he throws out a message here and there or whatnot on a post. And yeah, no, it's, it's cool. You mentioned hunting with uh, you and Chris kind of correspond back and forth around hunting. Uh, do you do quite a bit in the fall? I try to. Um, last year I got a pretty nice elk, so I was really excited about that. I went out with my grandparents and, and got that. So sent a picture to Chris right away and then he sent a picture of his right back and his was like three times the size of mine. So I don't like, know oh, how thanks. they do that because Colorado is so jam-packed with population that you'd think there's nothing left for game out there but somehow he still finds it doesn't he? Yeah well it's, it's a huge area out there like even riding where his zones are it's just massive so yeah it'd be really cool to actually go down there and experience that. But he's he's probably one of the only ones hiking at 11,000 feet to get these animals yeah, there, down. There's no way I could keep up to him. No way at that elevation. <laughs> it's funny yeah. when I stayed at his place one summer, we were doing the Project Adventure side-by-side film and he was up, you know, like dedicated 6 a.m. doing his hour and a half workout and going hard. And here I was laying in bed thinking I had the flu because I couldn't hardly breathe because you were getting <laughs> enough oxygen in your body. You felt like, felt sick. It's so funny at that elevation, but yeah. It's a cool experience down there. He's got an awesome setup and man, has he worked hard for it. Oh, for sure. Deserves every bit of it. Yeah. So you mentioned your grandparents, you guys went on hunting. That was kind of around Grand Prairie where you're living right now. Yeah. Yeah. Just north of Grand Prairie is where I grew up. So Blueberry Mountain area. It's not a mountain, but uh, more of a molehill. More of a little, yeah, a little bump on the, on the earth. But, but you got your feet wet and sledding out there, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Um, it's pretty cool. Actually, I think I, uh, about eight years i think it was my eighth birthday um my grandpa surprised me with this old elan 250 yes like bogey wheels Mm -hmm. little springs 100 bogey wheels yeah yeah a lot of bogey wheels um it was passed down from his dad to him and so he passed it down to me and that's how i kind of started sledding and so you were eight getting this elan what condition was it when you first got it when you were eight it was like in immaculate condition (laughs) did it stay that way for long no no it didn't um that's always the case it's just you get this beautiful sled and you're like man it's lived like 30 years like this it's just mint and then you grab it and that's like not two weeks later like gerber was talking about one of the sleds he got and he just like tore the whole right side of the sled off hitting a culvert trying to hit an approach and a jump and it's just like we're so bad as kids on these machines well i mean it's uh it started just with his trap line. So that's where we kind of originally started. That's where I started riding. And, uh, and then from there over the years, you know, you get a tundra. So oh, it's got a little more power. And so you start hitting snow banks and stuff like that and blowing the seat off the sled. And <laughs> parents yelling at you to take care of the stuff. And, and then, uh, yeah, I remember first bigger sled was a 500 twin Polaris 2 up. Big power, 500. Fan cooled. And what, like what age were you then? Uh, Would have been like 12. Okay. I believe somewhere around there. And uh, steady snapping the torsion arms off all the time. Trailing arms. I mean, it got to the point where my grandpa, he drilled out the hole so many times and put bigger bolts in that he's like, you can't break this anymore because I, I, there's nothing left. It's, we're up to like a one inch bolt by this point. Oh, one inch bolt, windshield's gone, hoods are blown off, you know, two up seats are falling off. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. So you yeah. grew up on the trap line and you just fall around your grandfather yeah. and he'd take you through. Growing up, I always heard the term trap line and I always thought it was like, like a cut line. Like you go in one direction, you come out. And what I didn't realize is it's like, you know, a vast, large area yeah. that you're allowed to trap on. Yeah. Um, so most trappers have like a big loop they'll do in that mm-hmm. area and you can cover a lot of ground. And it's like, that's a big historic part of the West in Canada, isn't it? Oh, for sure. It's a big part. I mean, it was a lot of just game trail kind of loops, flags set up at certain trees. So you kind of, you know, had a direction. I mean, my grandpa knew everything like the back of his hand but i was lost most of the time but <laughs> so he would break trail you just ride in his yeah and just, just follow him around follow him around yeah yeah what a cool way to grow up though i mean lots of people talk oh they started mountain biking or dirt biking or whatever and then they kind of got into a sled a little bit and yeah. started pushing the boundaries but like 
I think your story can relate to so many people. It's like, oh, grandpa's trap line or my dad's trap line or whatever. Yeah. And you start on some old base model sled, like you said, a 250 single cylinder. Yeah. And you kind of just, you know, get your feet wet, tour around a little bit, get the outdoors, and then you get hooked on it. And then you want to start pushing. So you started into like river banks and creek banks and stuff like that then in the surrounding area because like you said like they were not really and you were in farmer's fields and bush yeah. but it was pretty flat mm-hmm. so the kind of challenges that you guys found were in river banks like on the peace river right eh? oh for sure uh the the river banks were the biggest one there's always the wind would blow and make a big snow drift yes you know off the bank so you're doing drops you know two foot drops and we're just like you know, amazed and just blown away and we'd lose the sled and it would go down the hill and then we can't get it back up. So we're walking, you know, two miles back to the farm to get mom and the tractor and ropes and try to tow these sleds back up the hill. So, I mean, yeah, no, it was, uh, it wasn't me. I, I enjoyed it. It was, and I would just go do it again. Right. Do you and, think that helped you, like shape you or who your riding is? today and like who you are as a sledder and how much kind of respect you probably have for building that sled and and getting it to a point where you're like yeah this thing's ready for me to abuse it yeah i think i learned a lot on how aggressive i was back then and this like you said the stuff that i wreck and and now i just know i'm like i can't do what i want to do with these sleds unless i build these specific parts because they're not meant to do what a lot of us do with them nowadays so so fast forward a few years you get a little bit older you start riding 800s and things like that and you text me a little tidbit and you're like you got to ask about powder king i think it was 2013 2014 yeah what happened powder king 2013 uh it was a big learning curve um it was almost springtime just got a big big dump of snow there and uh it was a last minute trip with myself and a few guys and we went up there and none of us really had proper gear, you know, avalanche gear, all that kind of stuff. Um, had an avalanche bag, but just wore it more so to carry my snacks and Right. So uh yeah, there was uh this big open face hill and we're like, Oh yeah, fresh snow, like, okay, let's start high marking. Let's like, do it. Yeah, right everybody's excited we got newer sleds and we got videos going and we're all excited so uh there was this big rock face about three quarters of the way up the hill and uh i uh i was certain i could make it over that we kept cutting below it and you're gonna horseshoe around above it yeah and uh i'm like okay well i know i need to lighten up so off goes the avalanche bag. no off goes the jerry can you know, whatever I could take and everything out, you know, storage compartments and lighten the sled up and, uh, started shooting up there wide open. And, and, uh, I was like, oh yeah, like I got speed, like I'm doing this for sure. And I get up and over the, the rock face and I start cutting across it because it was about 20 meters, 30 meters of like a rock face and then kind of looped down the other side again. And uh, as I was cutting across, I just seen this big crack go in front of me. And I I didn't really even know what to do, to be honest. I just kind of was like, okay. And I came around the rock face. The snow started to take me in the sled. And I knew I wasn't going to ride it out because it was a really big, long hill. And um, it kind of had like a hump in the middle, about halfway down. And... uh, I just, I was right where at the end of it, essentially. And, um, like the trigger point, like the, you were at the very top. Yeah, at the very top of it, but it still was like taking the sled in slowly. And, uh, I just, I said, I have to jump. I tried anyways. So I jumped off the sled backwards and, uh, I still landed in the debris. And, uh, so I started sliding with it. I seen my sled kind of just disappear under the snow. And then it got to the midway point of the hill and I just seen like a big roll, like the snow was just rolling. And I just knew like it wasn't going to be good. And uh, it sucked me under. And it honestly kind of was a blur. Like I don't really, 
remember a whole lot besides uh, everything kind of stopped and it was quiet and I couldn't really breathe. I was just like taking little breaths. And, uh, but I can move my fingers on my right hand. And it felt like I was tapping like on the top of snow, essentially. And then I could hear vibration sleds kind of ripping up the hill. And, uh, yeah, I could hear digging and like yelling and whatnot. So, um, and this was pretty quick after you. Yeah, it was very quick because they could see my fingers on top of the snow. Luckily, to be honest, if, if, uh, like I didn't have a beacon, I didn't have anything on like, that's wild to think like, you know, Riley and I discussed this with the avalanche his dad was in and I remember being out in CAC with lots growing up. You know, I've been sledding since 1990 or whatever. And there was a lot of time through the 90s where it was just like, that was so common. And then those yeah. SOS, those old SOS beacons kind of came in and lots yeah. of people were running those and they were pretty archaic, but yeah. still something. Yeah. And then probes became kind of more normalcy and then shovels and things like that. But 2013 was well into the 2000s. Oh, yeah. And I can't stress it enough that like when I started filming with like Slednecks and some of the more pro guys that had been involved in situations like you're describing, mm -hmm. it was kind of an eye opener to be like, you can't take the chances like that. Like you have to ride with the bare minimum. But the biggest thing was the awareness, yeah. right? Yeah. So like what you're describing, like kick the pack off, whatever, like in our oh. group, we'd be like, what do you do? Like yeah. immediately we'd like shut that down. Yeah. But it's interesting, like the group of people you can be in and just be so unaware, right? Yeah. So you cut this slide, you're in it, you're under the debris and your friends are shoveling you out. Then what, they get to you? Yeah, they, uh, they dig my face out first. They pretty much just followed my arm down, right? And uh, my head was roughly two feet under the snow ish um and uh it was i wouldn't say i was on the verge of passing out but like lightheaded at that point and i mean it couldn't have been more than a few minutes honestly like it wasn't much um but yeah they dug me out and the day they it ended i mean we all, we all packed up and yeah. and we're lucky and i was i was in shock for sure do you think the rest of your group learned from that day and they still ride within like their means now? Like always oh, taking their AST1, AST2 courses and things yes. like that and riding more aware? Uh, the first thing I did after that was book an avalanche course. And uh, I didn't ride for a little bit just because I was a little freaked out. Um, but it was a, it's sad in a sense that that had to be the learning curve. But Unfortunately, there's a lot of events that happen like that where those kind of things have to happen for people to open their eyes. And, and I mean, now it's, it's, uh, it's, it's huge. I've done some, I've done my avalanche training almost every year, if not every couple of years. Um, I do a lot of it in Valemont with Frozen Pirate, um, Curtis there. So learned a lot from him, awareness, knowing the terrain you're in and, uh, and also, you know, noticing that with other people um riding through a zone and you see a group of guys that are doing something that on a face that you maybe have seen slide before or you just yourself think it's probably not the safest with the conditions right so how do you approach a group like that because i've been in situations where it's just like you want to throw a wrench at these guys because they'll talk back to you and it, be like oh, how do you know and you're mm -hmm. just like man why can't you just take it? You know, like I'm approaching this nicely. Yeah. I'm a nice guy. Yeah. And here I am just trying to give you a word of advice. Yeah. Cause we're professionally in the back country, you know, hundred plus days a year. And we're just trying to share a little bit, but a lot, it seems like some people are just not willing to, to learn, you know, not willing to take that advice. It's tough. Cause it's like you said, there's been multiple groups I've rolled up on and, you know, just nicely mentioned hey i've seen this hill slide lots you know it's a very well known um triggered hill easily triggered and uh they you know give you potential attitude or whatnot back right and uh you know the only thing you can do in that situation is know that you you did what you thought was right and you, could, and voiced you tried, it and yeah. you tried right and uh yeah it's so interesting it 
I personally think with social media and, and awareness, I think so many people are getting the word out. You know, it, like you said, it doesn't have to get to a point where someone in your direct group on that day has a burial or partial burial to get you to be understand to like, oh, okay. We're the, I think now it seems to me anyway, with social media and, you know, just raising awareness seems to be more normal, yeah. more commonplace. Um, and I don't know if that goes with, you know, back in the day, you were probably on some aftermarket turbo, you know, 163, 174 or something like that. Whereas nowadays you just get it, you know, off the shelf with yeah. warranty. So it's just like so many people could just go out never being on the back country and never being on a sled in their life and just like accessing these areas. Exactly. Yeah. It's these sleds can nowadays take you into, you know, like you said, a factory out of the box turbo is going to take you up shoots or hills that back in the day four stroke 400 horse turbos were trying to get up right so yeah it's uh i think the avalanche awareness and and that kind of stuff needs to keep getting pushed as hard as it does and do you think that burial was one of the scariest points riding in the backcountry for you uh, that would be one of them um i i had another close call in 2019 um in revelstoke uh we were it was cody borchers riley suhan uh kyle saxon was there and a, a number of other people and uh it was just we're ripping the day having fun and whatnot and uh, riley built a backflip jump and uh it was fairly large to like a flat landing and uh so Riley, we shape this jump and it looks like a wall. Straight up. Yeah. And, I, you know, I had butterflies just looking at it. So there ended up being like 30 random people sitting there, cameras out watching and everything. So um, Riley goes, goes into it, stomps it, like even over rotates a little bit. Um, we're all just pumped and excited and hugging and. And, and what sled I, is he run? Is it 146 or 154 did he have? Do you remember? I believe it was a 154. Okay. Um, possibly 146. I can't remember exactly. But he over-rotates. So he, that gives you confidence to say like, okay. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, he made that look easy. But Ry Riley's really experienced with, you know, his mountain biking background. And he's just very naturally talented when it comes to a lot of that stuff. And uh, so Kyle Saxon got all you know excited and whatnot vibes are high adrenaline's running kyle just goes stops it um over rotates also a little bit and when he landed he landed so hard that he snapped his running boards off on the back and uh so we're again excited everybody's just like the vibe screaming. is high. the vibes are super high and i just got this like huge shot of adrenaline and i'm like i got this right like I can do this. So I'm looking at the jump and there's this big trench in the takeoff. So Cody comes over and he's like, you thinking about it? And I was like, yeah, man, like, what do you think? He's like, well, like, if you feel confident, like, you know, you just got to be committed, right? So I start shaping the jump. Everybody's kind of hanging out and having fun. And I'm just kind of shaping it by myself. And I was just shaping it with the trench from the tracks not really knowing what I'm doing per se. But just cleaning it up. Just cleaning it up. Um, I get up on this hill that you kind of have to, like uphill in run, and then a corner, and then you just have a straight shot into it. So I finally just, I'm like mentally telling myself, like, you got this, you got this, like, just be commit, just commit. And uh, I come down the hill, make my corner, and I look at the jump, I'm like, that just looks like a normal, like straight jump, essentially. I'm like, that doesn't look the way it did when it was first built. I'm just like, no, that's fine. Just commit. And I, I just remember the feeling hitting the takeoff and pulling. And I felt like I just wheelied. Like I, I just immediately, the way I felt the sled took off wasn't what I vision riley and kyle and i got about almost upside down and i just barely i remember barely letting my legs like loose a little bit and the sled just pulled away from me 
So the next thing I know, I'm flying in the air, my back towards the ground, the sled's kind of above me. Chasing you chasing to the ground. Me. Um, it disappeared. And then I'm like, that's the last thing I remember. I'm like, I'm good. And then the next thing I remember, I waking up, trying to get my breath, like wind knocked out of me, can't breathe, what felt like forever. And uh, Riley was there, Cody, Kyle, they're all grabbing me like, hey, are you okay? And uh, I was like, I'm good. Like I got my breath back and they're all shocked. Like they're looking at me like Cody's like, I'm calling a heli right now. Like you need to get helied out of here. And I'm like, dude, I'm good. Like, I think I'm fine. I'm fine. Like my arm hurts, but I'm good. Minor. So long story short, I, I rode out of there and, uh, well, on the trail, I started kind of like passing out and whatnot, but I mean, it was a really close call. Like I was lucky that Riley gave me his chest protector before I went and did it because the thing landed directly on top of me and broke my hand and some ribs and severe, severe concussion. Um, I dealt with that for like six, seven months. So hold up. <laughs> you broke some ribs and your, some bones in your hand and obviously got, took a huge beating. Yeah. And wrote out. Yeah. Um, I, you I don't. That. You, didn't, you didn't talk about that part of what you said, the sled landing on top of you. Like, everyone knows it's 550 pounds coming down out of the sky on top of you and bad stuff can happen. But so you had some pretty, pretty damaging, you know, like injuries from that. Yeah. It was a long, long recovery. Um, the head injury was the worst. Um, I remember when Tira was driving me home, I ended up going into, unconscious and into a coma in the truck just from the elevation change from revelstoke to home and uh so then i was in the hospital i was unconscious for i think like 14 hours and then when i woke up i was actually fully body paralyzed all i could do is move my eyes and so i didn't know scary. i didn't know what happened I, I didn't know if we got in a car accident or what and so then they knocked me out again and then a few hours later, I woke up and then within a few hours started getting like body movement back and whatnot. But I was told it was just like a spinal shock, just like it took a day and a half for those injuries to actually start kicking in just from like the shock and adrenaline and everything from the whole scenario. Not until you were driving home from Revelstoke. Yeah. And that's like, like yeah. a nine hour drive. Yeah. Oh yeah. On a good day, it's a nine hour drive. Yeah. Wild, man. Yeah. Yeah, I knew you took a lick, but that's next level. Yeah, no, it, uh, which was also another eye opener, a lucky moment for me, but, um, definitely changed the way I view things. And when I go to push, you know, push those limits, making sure you have the right guys there and support and, and, and all that stuff, safety, right? So. Cody is a good mentor in the backcountry when it comes to things like safety and being aware and on it. Do you think it comes from age or his experience or being involved in some of these like big wrecks and things from over the years? Like, where do you think that comes from for him? A silver Fox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's full of wisdom. Um, Cody from, since I met him, he's been a, a huge uh, idol of mine and, I've learned so much from him and uh he's, he's the he's, one that kind of introduced you into like more of this style of sledding eh? like, oh 100 percent, yeah yeah back in the riders days and meeting him there and then meeting sue han and cody kind of took me under his wing a little bit i should say in a sense and and really uh saw my drive and and wanted to be part of that right and and he's been through some wrecks Oh over the years and his injuries are far beyond what i've gone through but uh there's most a lot humans have gone through <laughs> yes <laughs> poor yeah, guy yeah yeah some of it bad luck some of it self-induced but either way yeah the poor guy has taken some beatings he needs his borch lattes in the morning for sure <laughs> he deserves them yeah for sure <laughs> so he took you under his wing and you came out and started riding revelstoke pretty regularly yeah Pretty much after the first time I rode Rebel Soak, I was you were hooked. I was hooked. There again comes that addictive nature. Yeah, hundred percent. Back to it. <laughs> I, 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 uh, the train, the people, um, the snow, the whole vibe. It, it's just a different vibe down there. Um, 
I enjoy every riding zone. I join being in the mountains in general, but um, the just the atmosphere down there is just. Yeah, I don't think about uh, life per se. In a sense, it's just like sledding and let's go. And I don't know if that's because of the amount of snow they get or how mild the temperatures are that brings all those people out to just enjoy yourself because it ain't the sunshine. I'll tell you that. Like mid, no, it's mid very... season in Revy, you're you're not seeing the sun for no. months on end sometimes. Yeah. But it must just be that, you know, it's mild. You want to be outdoors. Everyone is so outdoorsy there. You're earning your turns on the ski hill sometimes. Yeah. Guys like Greg Hill are putting on a million steps a year. Like it's, yeah. it's pretty cool to see, like you mentioned, the vibe there. But it doesn't matter if you go to a restaurant or coffee shop or wherever, grab fuel from in town. It's just everyone's got that same stoke, don't they? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, it's from the people that you meet to the, the vibe, the food the weather, the snow, um, like Sammy Carlson, I met him up on the hill, you know, he's a huge pro skier and he ended up sitting on my hood of my sled and I like pushed him off the mountain so he can get more speed off this jump. Like it just things like that. Right. It's just, that's really pretty cool. mind blowing. Yeah. See Sammy and what he can do on a set of skis. That's yeah, crazy. It's wild. He's like, you know, he sees me drop this cliff and then I come up there and he's like, you're crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> do you see what you're doing? You're doing a million flips and twists off this massive cliff. Yeah. 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 For Sammy Carlson to tell you you're crazy, that's, uh, that's yeah. a big compliment. Yeah. So you had your big get off on a straight flip and then you started hooking up with the Swedes a little bit and riding with them when they come over to Canada and you ended up getting some redemption. Yeah. Um, Andreas and Albin and uh, Pontus, they, I kind of met them through just the group. Like there's a, uh, and they are so knowledgeable in all these crazy rotations. And yeah, talk about and, air awareness. Those guys oh, know it. It's like yeah, they're born with it. Yeah, 100%. It's a complete natural talent, I believe. Like it, they're just born with it. They're meant to do it. And uh, yeah, we, I didn't have any plans of doing anything the one day. And, uh, we just end up in this one spot and Andreas was like, do you have any plans? Like, do you want to do anything? And I'm like, well, like I really want to do a 270. Of course. Um, They're all the rage right now. Yeah. Right. And uh, he's like, okay, well let's do it. I was like, okay. He takes me to this spot where um, I think the year prior, um, McNulty and him and a few other guys were doing some flips in 270s, like just good train to do it. And we, spent an hour shoveled up this jump and uh he just gave me two rules he said just pull and don't let go just do that and you're fine he makes it sound simple doesn't he and, yeah. he, sim <laughs> he simplifies it he takes out all the gray area for you and just yeah. says just do these two things and if you can look me in the eye and promise me you're gonna do that you will land it yeah and uh he essentially asks like promise me you're going to do that. Like, that's what you have to do and you're going to stomp it. Yeah. Borch was there. I loop by him, gives me a high five and just hooting and hollering. And I'd make my turn around and I'm just looking at the takeoff and, you know, just all these things are rolling through my head and I'm just like, commit, commit. Like you got this, right? Like I, I know I have it. I just need to believe in myself essentially. Right. So I just came into it wide open and just, that's what I did. I pulled and pulled and held. And what sled was that on? It was a 22 boost Polaris. Oh yeah. So I remember looking at my Jack video. Speed. Oh, I looked back at my video, my GoPro, and it was like 158 or 168 <laughs> kilometers an hour. And I'm like, that's why it spun so fast. But uh, yeah, no, it came around and stomped it. And it wasn't a straight flip. That is the goal essentially again and that's just a personal goal for myself right. and uh but that adrenaline rush and that like it just you can't there's nothing else in the world like it do you think the boost like for obvious reasons it helps to come around a flip do you think that's why you were able to land the 270 or do you think it would have been harder on an na uh i don't think so honestly i think it's yes it can help you i think at times but i did another 270 last year on my 9r and uh, it wasn't as big of a jump, but it still came around. And a lot of it is just honestly just believing in yourself and 
kind of having the right setup helps, obviously, initially. But um, just pull and hold on. I just kind of know what I got to do and, and just commit. Honestly. I see some guys like last year filming with Riley, and it's probably on that same 270 jump you're talking about. We found that one again, and Riley and Josh, and that's where Scott did his first. Yeah, yeah. And Josh almost did a mini flip. <laughs> like, yeah. Like on a boost, you almost like can idle into it and then just like, yeah. And like you said, like 170 kilometer an hour track speed, that thing is wanting to come around. That momentum of that, you know, 50 pound track or whatever it is, yeah. wants to come around like that's for sure noticeable like you you watch like you said the speed he kind of can come in at and then just you get that rotation right away whereas a an na you need to be getting some momentum coming in prior yeah you almost need a longer takeoff the whole yeah. shape has to just help it through mm -hmm. carry a little bit more speed a little bit higher trajectory to allow it to you know to finish yeah whereas the boost is like like i said it was almost like a mini flip that i was witnessing i'm like he was like laughable. He was like dragging his helmet off the head, like the snow when he yeah. went around upside yeah. down. It was so funny. Yeah. But it was cool to see Scott do his and that was on an NA9R. And yeah. Riley was on a boost as well. But um, yeah, all three of them were able to stomp that and come down with it. It's cool to be around that. And I'd be lying if I said I don't get nervous for you guys sometimes when it's like, man, are you sure about this or whatever? Because it's, it's totally on your guys' shoulders where you guys feel comfortable and building the jump. And like you said, it's just like, if you've never tried it before, or you you know you don't have a foam pit at home to practice this on. It's like, sure, you could build all the confidence, but like, do you have the knowledge and air awareness when you're bringing it around? Like, yeah. and Andreas has kind of naturally got. It's like, for him to do that front flip was like, how do you even train for that? I, you know, I I don't even know what to say about that. Honestly, the front flip is just it's wild. You know, a lot of time just to think about a back flip, but then to and you, you can see it through the photos and the videos of his air awareness on like how he's tucking. And then it's at wild. a certain point, he starts to look sideways so that he can start seeing the landing, right? And I think that's why the 270 is kind of my, my goal to perfect a bunch prior to straight flip. Because I feel like even though I'm not blind at a certain point, where you are in a straight back flip, that you get that little bit of that air awareness of the rotation um and i feel like that just is going to help myself a lot for for the straight so I'll tell you right now it's not going to hinder that <laughs> yeah any any opportunity you have to invert that sled and practice on a 270 will help yeah, for sure for sure yeah but then it might build bad uh you know characters or bad traits when you go to do the straight flip because you'll always want to be going over one shoulder sideways yeah it's uh i've uh i honestly even just stand on my sled at home in the shop and just practice on like proper pulling and like in my mindset of like okay i'm going off the jump now skis are coming off the lip now pull like just just running scenarios like that through my mind and, and you know there's a lot of people that can just stomp them and uh but turcott and andreas and and cody you know just the knowledge that they've been feeding me now since that incident uh, just soaking that in and taking every little bit from everybody and and just use that all when i go and do it so yeah years ago cody and i were at the there was like a sled next invasion tour that stopped at the white court invasion they have you know this white court snowmobile club is awesome they got a great network of trails there yeah and they had this big invite and um cody wasn't riding at it but sam rogers dane ferguson and a few others were there yeah and sam was setting the world's distance record for a backflip and it was off of a bars ramp and I, I can't remember how far it actually was the gap just over 100 feet or 120 or something like that i think yeah. it was sizable it was yeah. sweet but um i remember cody sitting with him in the trailer and he's just like just be equal bar to bar like do you know like on a gap like that you don't want to be even one percent you know favoring one side or the other you have to be so straight yeah. or else you're going to land so crooked yeah so it's crucial like you're pulling a lot of force off the takeoff yeah and yeah one little bit one way or the other can make a big effect when you're Huge. going a long distance like that yeah 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 it's so interesting so this season what are you running for a sled uh 9r 
again 155 9r with that uh the new 3.25 track so give that a whirl excited um the other day when i rode it track felt really good early snow though tough to say but you yeah. weren't scooping a whole lot wait till mid-season that thing's really gonna shine yeah yeah so and no boost why not the boost <sighs> boost is fun it's a lot of extra weight though too yeah and uh i think for my riding style to be honest i really enjoy you know looking back and all the turbo guys struggling to keep up um, it's a pride thing for you oh 100 percent. whether it's you know uh my riding or the sled setup or both um it's just i just so much enjoy being at the top and these turbos are struggling and they're just you know guzzling all their water and they're out of fuel and and then i'm like well i got like a full tank still so let's keep going let's keep pushing yeah i the boost is is fun in deep snow but i think for my riding style like i really enjoy drops you know having that good throttle response right there and uh the less weight i feel like i just i ride better on a naturally aspirated than a turbo at the end of the day you have more energy i find mm -hmm. your upper body and like if you're doing two three four five days consecutively it's like you start feeling it day two day three and then you're really yeah. starting to get wore down with that extra weight like you're mentioning on the front end of the sled and like remember like turbos like five six years ago where you're just piling on the weight <laughs> yeah. to an already fairly heavy sled nowadays like technology's come so far they've really refined the riding ergonomics to them where it's yeah. like it, it definitely helps that yeah but you're absolutely right like anytime you can shed 15 20 pounds off the front of your sled yeah makes a huge difference and people just forget about that yeah i ride with people we'll be breaking trail into a new zone and they still have their jerry can on the back and i'm like get that thing off and you're like no no it's fine I need, you know i'll carry fuel for the group and it's like no no, no it's not for your back it's for mine because every yeah. time i got to go over there and help you get unstuck it's like give yourself every opportunity to get up this hill easier like, yeah get your backpack you know like don't take the heavy pack off like you did in 2015 yeah, no, no definitely don't do that but if you can shed some weight off of that you know and leave some parts or pieces or whatever you don't need extra two liters of coca-cola or something like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah coca-cola and chocolate bars oh man yeah. that's a yeah. staple of sledders yeah. isn't it yeah 100 percent. yeah but yeah it's uh it's interesting to see where the sleds are going well nick i know i can speak for all the listeners where i'm excited to see when you finally pull your straight flip uh you'll have to let us know so we can grab some cameras on that but uh we're excited to see what 2023 2024 takes you yeah i'm super excited and uh the season's uh, about to start, so some big storms coming, so I'm really excited. Yeah, Awesome, Nick. Well, thanks for sitting down with us, and we'll catch you on the hill. Yeah, thanks, Mike.